My name is Alex Cole. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the assistant director of summer sessions. Um, and I do have my uh, email up here on the screen in case there's anything at any point that you want to reach out about. If there's anything we don't cover today, I'm definitely happy to be a contact for you all um, and just to, to help answer any questions you may have. Um, and so this presentation today, it's really going to be focused on um, two parts. So we are going to cover some important policies like Victoria mentioned. Uh, not a lot is changing for the summer, to be honest, so it's very similar policy-wise um, to how it has been in recent summers, but there's some important things that we want to just cover, um, things that, you know, students may be asking questions about or may be confused about, um, and so just always helpful, I think, as you're engaging with them to kind of have that background. Um, and then we're going to talk a lot about data. So who is on our campus this summer? Who can you expect in your classroom? Um, and sort of how trends have changed over the last few years. We know with the pandemic, it's been just a wild ride. So, um, you know, different different um, student behaviors, uh, different, different things happening. Um, they're being drawn to different things. So we're gonna cover that and just kind of get the lay of the land for this summer. Uh, we will have some time for questions at the end, but if there's any burning questions as I'm going through, please feel free to jump in. That will go ahead and get started. So very generally, um, kind of just looking at summer and, and the students we serve, these are the, the main populations that you'll be engaging with. Um, so first and foremost is always UC Berkeley students. That's definitely the largest population in the summer. And we know that that's for a number of reasons, but you know, first and foremost, I think as we've engaged with Berkeley students, we know that they're really trying to do it all. They have a lot on their to-do list that they're trying to check off while they're at Berkeley. Um, they often are double majoring, they may be studying abroad, um, and there's just so much time in the academic year for them to do all these things, right? And so summer, I think, has really become a tool for Berkeley students to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. We have full minor programs they can earn in the summer to get a minor, um, wonderful study abroad programs. And so I think it's just showing, you know, that, um, that they're really wanting to make their most of their time at Cal. We know that something around 70% of UC Berkeley undergrads will take at least one summer term. Other than that, we definitely see other UC students. So students maybe who are coming back to the Bay Area for the summer, um, UC students who are wanting to take Berkeley online classes um, and just kind of experience Berkeley coursework and credit that towards their, their home UC. Um, and then a lot, a lot of visiting students. So um, different populations of visitors for different reasons. We definitely see community college students who are seeking to transfer to UC Berkeley. They may be wanting to sample out a course, so they may be seeking to transfer elsewhere, um, but they're really wanting to kind of get ahead with their coursework in that way. We see students from other universities, domestic and international universities, um, definitely. We also have an international affiliate program. So we partner with international universities around the world to bring students to summer. Um, so they may send a population of students every year. Um, so that is definitely a big and wonderful program. They get a lot of benefits and a lot of extra support for their students. It's definitely been a lot smaller in recent years with the pandemic, um, but it's something we're working actively to grow. Yeah. Was it well with students from other UCs coming here for the summer? It may be that they're from the Bay Area and so they're living at home for the summer, so, so it's very convenient for them. It may be the coursework, something that's being offered that they're really interested in. Um, we do have certificates in the summer, so there's a number of programs that maybe offer a Berkeley student a minor, but another student could come and still earn a certificate for that same program. So that can be something that can be appealing for them if it's, particularly if it's like the subject matter that they're really interested in. Um, yeah, and then we, we do have high school students in the summer. So this is a population that's really growing on our campus that we're really excited about. Um, and that we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, in this presentation. But first things first, jumping into a few important policies. Um, so the one thing I wanted to stress is that there is no cancellation fee in summer anymore. We did in the past, pre-pandemic, there was a $100 cancellation fee. But nowadays, students can enroll in classes, they can set a summer schedule, and then they can change their mind. They may get a job. Um, they may have another opportunity and they may no longer want to do summer sessions. So they can completely cancel um, and get all of their money back. They just have to be mindful of the cancellation deadline. So it's basically before the start of their first session. 
once the session starts, they are going to be responsible for things like the campus fee and non-refundable fees. Um, there is a $25 non-refundable application fee for visiting students, so that's the only other thing to be mindful of. Visitors do have to pay that fee. But other than that, we definitely see students taking advantage of this. You know, we know their plans change and they need that flexibility. Once the session starts, they do also have quite a bit of flexibility to change their schedule. So they may add, drop classes, um, so they can definitely do that. We know sometimes they find themselves in classes that maybe are not the right fit. So it's very important for them to be able to make those changes. And so they have up until the second Friday um, of the class. So basically two weeks into the class, they can still make changes to their schedule. They can swap classes, um, they can drop, and they will get a tuition refund for that class. Uh, it's a little shorter for sessions E and F. So they have about one week that first Friday to make those changes. After the refund deadline, this is where it gets a little complicated, so no need to memorize this. We have a team of advisors that can always help. Um, but basically, even if they drop late, they can um, receive tuition credit, so where it can be applied towards a later class in a later session. So basically, if they drop a session A class after the refund deadline, for whatever reason, they will be generated um, a credit for the number of units because they are on the hook for paying for those, but they can then apply that credit to say a session D class if they add it later on. So that can be really helpful for students. Um, we just sometimes see them, you know, not quite understanding the, the sequence that they need to add things in. And so we really ask them to reach out to our team who can work with them every step of the way and make sure that that gets applied exactly as they're intending. And so that's the email at the bottom, summer at berkeley.edu. Um, and that's a really wonderful catch-all email, it's a whole team of advisors. They get back within 48 hours to staff questions, uh, faculty questions, student questions. So summer at berkeley.edu. And then lastly, the grade change deadline. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to ask, the non-tuition fees, you can get those back, like for the summer, like the day. You can get those back anytime before Monday. Right. Yeah. If they're a session A student, they need to cancel prior to Monday starting um, to get the campus fee back. But then they have two weeks after that and they can get their tuition fees back, but not the non-tuition fees. Right. How much are the non-tuition fees? I think the campus fee is $385 this summer. Um, so that's the, the primary fee for Berkeley students that they'll be paying. There's some other fees for, for students who are visiting. Got it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And usually that is the case. Usually uh, when it gets this close to the session starting, I think they know they're going to be taking some classes this summer. They just may be changing at that point, whether they're, they're starting and they find that it's not the right fit. So I think, you know, there is a lot of flexibility, I think, um, with the pandemic and, and the cancellation fee going away. I think that was a really big improvement for summer and for students, no longer having that hundred dollar fee. Uh, the deadline to change their classes from past to no pass is two weeks prior to the end of the session. So that's for all sessions. And um, before that point, they have a lot of flexibility. They can change their mind, um, but they will be locked in after that point. Okay. Okay, so quickly jumping into summer 2023 trends. So this is really an overview. We're gonna dive into some of these a little bit um, further, but first and foremost, we are seeing an increase in UC undergrad participation this summer. So that's something we always look at. It's very exciting. Um, you know, when, they, when it's up, it's showing us that we're offering what they want. They're getting what they need. They're taking advantage of summer um, to really get ahead. And so from looking at this time last year to this time this year, we're up 7.1% in UC undergrad enrollments. So that's really great. Um, it's not as high as it was during the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021 when instruction was all remote. We saw some really interesting anomalies those years. So um, as soon as the decision to go remote was made, you see undergrad enrollment kind of went through the roof. I think we were up something like five or 6,000 in headcount um, really quickly. So we know, you know, with them being at home, not having a lot of other opportunities, studying was something that they could really do in those summers. They could really focus on getting ahead and with everything remote, they had a lot of access. They weren't having to pay for summer housing. Um, it was very affordable for students to, 
to take summer and get ahead with their degree requirements. This summer, summer minor and certificate enrollments are up 28%. That's also huge. It's showing us that not only are they taking classes this summer, but they're sometimes doing full programs. They're earning a whole minor. Um, so that's really exciting. Online classes are very popular. Um, there's now quite a lot of options. There's like hundreds of options for students to choose from in summer. So that has really given them a lot of choice and flexibility. And we've definitely seen some students drawn towards um, online instruction in the summer. We are seeing the return of our international visitors finally. So this year, visitor enrollments are up 42% from last summer. So we were really hopeful that with the return of in-person instruction last year, they were gonna come back. Um, and it, it wasn't quite the case. There were a lot of COVID-related complications still. So uh, Omicron surged right at the beginning of our application period. Lots of long visa, visa processing times we heard about. Just travel challenges uh, across the board. But this year it's looking different. So that's really wonderful, really optimistic that we're going to be able to welcome um, some really wonderful international visitors again. Um, and just a, you know, just a caveat that even though we're up so much from last summer, it's still nowhere to what we were pre-pandemic 2019 and before. Um, but you know, it's it's positive. Um, signs in the right direction. And yeah. Are we offering more online classes now than pre-pandemic? Yes, by a lot. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but in 2019, we had something like 40 to 50 or so fully online classes. Um, now there are over 200 for students to choose from. Some are synchronous, some are asynchronous. It does vary. Um, but departments have been really intentional about trying to offer some online options for their students. And they're going to stay. Yeah, it's it's likely. Um, you know, it, it changes year to year. They may decide, oh, this class wasn't a great fit for online, and the department may make some decisions around that. But for the most part, we're seeing trends in the direction that more and more will continue to be offered. Okay. But we also know that a lot of students are still looking for those in-person opportunities. So that's the one thing where when we're talking to departments, you know, we... You know, even though a lot of Berkeley students are really interested in the flexibility online offers, a lot more of them also want to be in person. A lot of visitors want to be in person and have that on-campus experience in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of special programs that are also doing better and better post-pandemic. So we have our Summer Abroad and Global Internship programs, which we launched last year and have grown quite a bit for this year. So that's great that, you know, our Berkeley students can once again travel and have those international opportunities themselves. And then pre-college, the high school program is also um, just getting more and more attention with students. This is really a visual representation of a lot of what I just said. Um, so we can kind of go through fairly quickly. 2017 and prior, our domestic and international data is combined. So you can kind of see that it looks a little different there. But in more recent years, we can see the breakout of international and domestic visitors. But I think what, what is most interesting about this graph is just if you're looking at 2019 to 2020, the, the big jump in the blue line, the UC undergrads, so that's that five to 6,000 in headcount that I was talking about. Um, so just, you know, whether we'll ever get back to that, I don't know. It was really, a, you know, just a unique time for our students when they were really taking advantage of coursework. Um, but we see kind of since then, we've leveled back to like 2019 figures, which is what we were really expecting. Um, this year is on here as well, though it's still very early. Like even though session A is starting on Monday, students will continue to roll, enroll in session C and D for, for several more weeks. Usually at this point, we're right around like the 80% mark of final enrollment figures. So we're expecting to be up from last summer. Um, so we're expecting it to be a very busy campus this year. <laughs> Busy classes, yeah. Does we know ahead of time uh, who our students are along these lines? Oh, like their breakdown? Yeah. So you can pull like rosters in Cal Central, uh, or sorry, um, Campus Solutions, mm -hmm. that will indicate whether they're like of international status, um, you know, whether they're mostly undergrads. Yeah. The high school, the high school one is difficult. Okay. Um, they show up as just international visitors usually, mm -hmm. or domestic visitors. Um, but if you have a question about a specific class, our team would be happy to help identify them if you'd like to. 
Um, chances are, if it's an undergrad class, you may be teaching high school students, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but a lot of times you won't know it, and and you know that's because they take it very seriously and they do really well, so they they tend to um, you know blend in with the undergrads. Can, can I just jump in one second? Yes. You probably do this anyway, but one of the things I do is to send out a pre-class yeah. survey mm -hmm. to try to get that information that feels like it's a bit more hidden in the campus system. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Was there any other yeah, question? Oh, I was just going to ask. So to reach out to you for administrative questions for the students is summer at berkeley.edu. Yeah, if you if you reach out to summer at berkeley.edu, um, it'll probably feed back to me from our team. But yeah, they'll they'll basically connect you with someone um, that can help you with that data. Is there a different email for instructors versus students? No, that's, oh. a, that's a great one. Yeah, great catch-all for everything. Um, because we have a team that's triaging. And if it is a, an instructor or staff question, often it does come back to, to my team. Um, but yeah, so you can definitely reach out to that one. And then I'll put my email back up at the end in case you want to reach out to me directly. That's also fine. Yeah, Doug. Question from the Zoom. Um, UC undergraduate refers to UC Berkeley or UC wide? It is UC wide. Um, it's predominantly UC Berkeley, but because it is a small fraction of students from other UCs that are that are attending, um, but it does include them. This is the session distribution at this point. So if we look at total enrollments um, for summer 2023 so far, this is where they're falling. Um, so we can see that session C is the largest, followed by session D and session A. Um, and the other ones are quite a bit smaller. So um, of course, this is largely based on how many classes are being offered. Um, most classes are being offered in session C. Um, also a lot in session D, um, and then just which types of classes, right? So session C tends to have a lot of STEM lab courses um, and just courses that may be higher enrolled, a lot of online courses in session C. So um, I think, you know, again, it's quite early for this year. I think this will shake out slightly differently in that D will likely grow. It won't be so far behind C, but you can count on um, most students taking classes in session C or D. That's also because that's when our visitors can tend to take classes um, and our newly admitted students. So because of their academic timelines and things like that, they tend to be more in session C and D. So jumping into online classes a little bit more, um, this is an area where, like we were talking about, it, the landscape is very different than it was pre-pandemic. Um, there are so many more options for students um, so online enrollment from last year to this year, um, looking at the same week of the enrollment period, is up 44.9%. So that's really a large amount. Um, when looking across all summer enrollments for this year, it's around the 40% mark that are online. Um, one thing to keep in mind if you are teaching an online class is that it's usually made up almost completely of Berkeley students. We know that visitors who are paying for Berkeley classes, they really do want to come to our campus. They want to experience our campus and have that study away experience. Berkeley students are here throughout the year, and often summer is a time where they may have other responsibilities. They may be working full time. They may be wanting to live at home with their families. They may be supporting families or traveling for different reasons. And so Having online options, it just allows them to make progress towards their degrees, but on a schedule that may be a little bit more flexible for them. Our high school student population, so this has really grown um, in recent years. We have um, quite a lot of, of summer students who are 16 years old or 17 years old in the pre-college program. So they may be showing up in your classes. We currently have 136 that are going to be in the residential program for this summer. So they are going to be taking two classes each in session C or session D. And then we have a number of students who are in a commuter or virtual program. So they may be taking online courses or they may be living locally and coming into the campus for the day and taking those classes as well. That number will keep growing because they can enroll on the same timeline as other students. So all the way up to June. Last year, we had 714 that were either commuter or virtual students. We also have 80 that are in a non-credit program. So that's a little different. They're not going to be in your classes. 
they're in sort of structured, um, tailored programming for them um, because it's only two weeks, but it is another population that is around campus. And the, the, you know, the biggest thing we, we hear question-wise from um, instructors about these students is you know, concerns about whether they're prepared for the coursework. So they're, they're almost exclusively in lower division courses. There may be a couple of exceptions, but you would have likely have heard about them. They have to basically demonstrate that they've taken a lot of prerequisites and are really ready for the, the upper division coursework and we get the, the sign off. But they, are, they could be in lower division courses. Um, just data-wise, they tend to do really well. Like these are very high achieving students. They have their sights set on Berkeley, usually. Often they do end up matriculating, which is really exciting for us. Um, because they are often the students that we want to see on our campus. So 52% received a grade of an A- minus or better last year. So that was really great. And then overall, the passing rate is around 90%. We do have um, a number who are on full ride scholarships. So 22 in the residential program and then several others in the virtual or commuter program. So we work with the Center uh, for Educational Partnerships in identifying students that would really be a great fit, that really need that early college experience and exposure, um, and that we know are going to do very well and likely end up at Berkeley someday. Or another wonderful four-year institution. There are others. <laughs> um, okay, so newly admitted students. So we're going to dive now into Berkeley students, specifically in the summer because that is the, the number one population that you'll be engaging with. The most, uh, most of the summer students who are Berkeley students in the summer are continuing from the spring term, right? So they're just continuing on into the summer. But there are a couple exceptions. We have a pretty big population of newly admitted students. So incoming freshmen or incoming transfer students who we welcome to take classes that very first summer. So before they start in the fall, they can enroll in freshman edge or transfer edge and basically get ahead with classes. They can get acclimated to campus. They benefit from a number of special programming opportunities and resources. They can do a mentorship opportunity through Berkeley Connect. And there is um, some specialized courses that they can enroll in. So for example, they may be exploring what major they wanna do through LNSW1, or they may be transfers that are really seeking to strengthen their skills, you know, that really are going into tough majors. And they really want to take um, certain courses that have been identified for them so that they can be on a really solid foot when they, when they jump in in the fall. We currently have 152 freshmen and 174 transfers, but that's going to continue to grow as well. It's really early for this population. And then just interestingly, um, if we look at the data for the past several summers, we know that there's actually a higher percentage of transfers in summer than we would expect given the population in the academic year. So what that's telling us, I think, is just they have an even shorter amount of time on our campus and more that they're wanting to do and needing to do. So summer can be really valuable for, for transfer students specifically. And then lastly, um, in addition to these populations, there are always some returning students who are being readmitted. Um, so they come through summer kind of on their path back into Berkeley. That's typically about one to 3% of the, the summer population. Jumping into some other data. So this is from Cal Answers and it's really looking at summer student demographics. These are all based on the UC Berkeley undergrads. Um, that are in summer. So we're kind of comparing, again, how that may look differently or similar to the academic year in general. We know that for this coming summer, 57% of students are female identifying, 41% male, 1% um, or so are non-binary, and 1% are declined to state. Uh, the caveat here is that this is collected at the time of their application, so quite early, and because of how it's collected, the non-binary number is likely higher by the time um, they're in your classes and things like that. So just something to always be mindful of, um, being respectful of pronouns. And then level one ethnicity. So again, this is from the their applications. Um, so it's the highest level, 39% um, 
are of Asian ethnicity, 25% underrepresented minority, 16% international. So for this particular um, data, it does separate out international students. So um, these are fully matriculated UC Berkeley students that are international students. And then 20% are white, other, or declined estate. state. Um, and so the, the differences here to pull out are that, you know, in the academic year as well, enrollment is um, higher for female identifying students. It's just a little bit higher than that for summer. So 57% is a little higher than the academic year figure. And then similarly, the international figure is higher in summer than we would expect based on enrollment in the academic year. And so, you know, what that's telling us is that international students are also taking advantage of summer kind of at higher rates. And, you know, we can kind of attribute that back to cost most likely. So in the summer, uh, there's only one fee rate for Berkeley students, right? They all pay the same rate. There's no in-state or out-of-state tuition difference. So summer can be a really big deal for certain students to get ahead. We definitely see them taking advantage. Yeah, Doug. Question. Um, curious why international is collected separately. Would international students all fall into some race, ethnicity, or demographics? Yeah, definitely. No, so they, they would all have their own ethnicities. Um, this is just for this particular call out in the UC application. It's like, I, I believe it's based on like a trumping system, so it all rolls into these categories. So it's not, um, it's not the best for specific ethnicity data. And then lastly, first gen status, we know that from recent summers, approximately at one third of UC Berkeley students enrolled in summer identified as first gen. And this is actually a little bit higher than the academic year by a few percent. A few other additional just considerations as we're thinking about summer students. So in addition to, you know, a higher percentage of transfer students, um, international students, we also see a higher percentage of seniors in summer. So we know a lot of students are on that summer degree list or they're extending their graduation term because they're really trying to take advantage of that very last summer before grad graduation. They may be needing to finish up certain requirements or they may be just wanting to finally get in that other opportunity. So a study abroad or a minor or just some classes they've been interested in this whole entire time that they haven't really been able to take because of how busy their schedules have been. So definitely a few more seniors than we may expect. We also know that there are student parents in summer, students that are supporting families and that may need, may need a little bit of extra flexibility. Approximately 130 student parent grants are awarded each summer. Um, we also know there are a number of students with disabilities um, in your classrooms. So the DSP program supports about 3,500 Berkeley students in the academic year. Many of those are also in summer. I don't have great data for how many, but we know that many of them are also taking summer classes. Uh, but we also know that our visitors also go through the DSP program for accommodations. And so there's, there's many more in the summer who are also taking advantage of those services. Um, and lastly, right as we're, we're wrapping up, I wanted to touch on financial aid. Uh, financial aid is something that our Berkeley students are relying on in summer, just like in the academic year. It's very important and it's allowing access for a lot of students to take those classes that they're really needing and wanting. Students must be enrolled in a minimum of six units to be aid eligible. So you'll find a lot of Berkeley students um, enrolling in at least six units in the summer. Many special programs are also designed that way to offer at least six units so that students can be packaged for aid. And the number of students um, participate or uh, benefiting from financial aid in the summer, it's very similar to the academic year. It's a little lower. Um, it's right around 60%. But if we look at data from the past few years um, of students who are of the highest need, 41% um, of UC Berkeley undergrads received the UC Summer Fee Grant. So that's a pretty large percentage. That means that their financial need was great enough that they actually um, received gift aid during the academic year. And then beyond that, an average of 29% received the federal Pell Grant. So that's the very highest level of need. So again, almost one in three. Um, there's some small data here from Cal Answers about how many 
um, grants, scholarships, loans, et cetera, have been awarded so far for this summer. Again, it's gonna change, it's gonna go up um, quite a bit as we, we get further into the summer term. But all this to say, you know, summer is often an additional cost for students. They're, they're often paying for these classes and it can be expensive, but a lot has been done to make summer more accessible for our Berkeley students um, and to offer them that, that aid that's really important. With that, I just want to open it up to any questions I can answer. Um, if there's anything I didn't cover, um, I'd love to, to dive into that for a few minutes. Yeah. When is the last day for a student in a six week term to add a class? So for session D, because that a. happens over so. A. So they can add up until the second Friday of the term. So they have about two weeks, two weeks from that day. Yep, and then it'll be the same for session D. So, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, after that it does tailor off the shorter sessions, but that's why we see students adding, dropping, changing classes all the way up until, until those June deadlines. Yeah. What's the minimum uh, course enrollment that we need for the course to be viable? Mm, that's a really good question. Yeah, it, it varies. So it's um, by the number of units. So, um, there is a whole table that I can I can give you access to. So it's it's basically um, the website is sal s s a l l dot berkeley dot edu that has them all listed. Um, so that's our that's kind of our department facing website. So it stands for summer session study abroad and lifelong learning. Um, so sol.berkeley.edu, and under there you'll you'll find um, different categories for like finance or um, scheduling. I think it's under the scheduling one. There's a whole breakdown for course cancellation minimums. Um, so it it just varies by the by the number of units. Um, but usually by now, like, are you teaching? It's a session A course. Yeah. So it would have it's definitely running. I mean, it, it, they would have been canceled by now. So even if. Can students still drop the course? They can, but it, it still runs at this point. Okay. Yeah, we have a cutoff. So, um, so, and you have to be notified at least two weeks, I think, in advance of the course start if there's any changes, like if it's not going to run. So at this point, it's, it's very set for sessions A and B. Um, there could be still some fluctuations for D if, you're, if your class is slow enrolled, but um, for C and D, I think even C is pretty set at this point, but yeah. Yeah. I actually just wanted to speak to um, a concern that Emily brought up. Um, if you feel like students will really, really struggle to be successful in your course if they add so big of a game, I know that's the case for me. I teach an eight week online asynchronous American cultures course. If yeah. students suddenly pop onto my roster towards the end of week two, I really, really worry um, not only that they you know, won't be able to pass the course, but I definitely worry that they won't have a sufficient amount of time to properly engage their material. And if that's the case for you, then you can talk with your scheduler in your department, and they can actually in enter an earlier cutoff date so that if the student wanted to add the course, they would have to reach out to you. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to, you know, if a student has an emergency, they want to talk to me, they absolutely need to add my course. Um, but I don't just want them suddenly popping up on my roster mm -hmm. and then week four or five contacting me and saying, I have no idea what's going on, I can't keep up, what do I do? Um, so that's, I think, it was a, good, a good way of kind of balancing um, yeah, that's a good point. I think so. The the two things I would say to that um, one, so they are based on the normal academic year drop deadlines, so it mirrors that. But I definitely understand like summer is shorter in general, right? Six or eight weeks is, is a lot shorter. Um, and I think the other the other thing I would mention, you know, is just that on that that class schedule or in your syllabus, if you can kind of call out these things these concerns in some way, I think that's really helpful for students as they're making these decisions, you know, so they have a little bit of, of understanding of that because because they do have the the idea now that they have some flexibility there, but if they see that, you know, as they're browsing classes, I think that can really help caution them and set expectations. Yeah. 
Uh, so all the summer students, they also have access to e-courses, and we can use the course as we work together. Yes. Yeah. And then what is the, when are grades due for us as instructors to enter after the end of the class? Yeah, so I was just looking at this. It, it, it's, they're listed by session, but it's like the following week. Um, so I, I know, I think it was session A I was looking, I think it was session A I was looking at, and it was, um, you know, after the session ends on Friday, I think they were due by the following Wednesday or Thursday. Is, yeah. Ka is Karen Denton the person who operates the grading system in summer as well as the regular academic year? I believe it's all the same. It's yeah, all the same. it should be the same. But so I'm not sure about the person. So Karen Denton is the person who operates the e-grade system. And if you're having an issue with grading, the grading deadline, she's mm. really good at working with you. So we can also post her information. It's Karen Denton, D-E-N-T-O-N. She's the longest serving employer employee at UC Berkeley. She's been here like 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> so she knows everything. She says, even if you don't have an issue, she's great to know because she knows everything. So. Oh, that's great. Thank yeah. you, Victoria. Yeah. Uh, is your final exam uh, compulsory for the summer session? A final exam? It, there is flexibility. Like some classes have a final project um, or yeah, essays and things. So it, it does vary by the class. It's another great thing to call out, um, you know, and, this, and you know, I, I think so students are browsing the class schedule, right, at classes.berkeley.edu, and there's a lot of information there for them. So if you're able to link your syllabus there or just put in some class notes section about what to expect, we find that's really, really helpful for them. Um, I think, you know, now we're, we're in kind of a steady space of being back to in-person instruction, but I know there was a lot of confusion last year where there were certain things that were required in person and certain things where instructors were giving more flexibility and students weren't really aware of that. So anything you can get on classes.berkeley.edu I think is so helpful and valuable. And so that's another thing the scheduler can really help with adding any important messages you want to send to students before they enroll. Yeah, I, I, had, I, had, uh, I had a prepared uh, this time. So I posted my syllabus uh, one week ahead, the last week, and it scared away some students. <laughs> <laughs> so my enrollment dropped. Oh no. And I'm, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is it because uh, the final exam is compulsory? Mm -hmm. uh, but I also said that uh, attendance is uh, compulsory because uh, it is in-person class. I, it's very standard. I mean, they should be expecting that for, my, for their classes, so I don't, I don't think that would be or it. Or could it be uh, like too much readings? <laughs> because it's they could be that. <laughs> <laughs> they could maybe read that. Yeah, they could maybe read that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm definitely giving final exams for my classes. That's uh, standard. But uh, my issue is, I'm looking at the schedule, and um, the class schedules are one hour and a half for me from Monday to Thursday, summer session C, mm -hmm. and I'm having to give the final exam the last day of class, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's an hour and a half. But, but I also teach uh, in spring and fall, and for those classes, the exams are in the exam period, mm -hmm. and right. they are three hours. Mm -hmm. And I have students from my previous semester who are doing incomplete, mm -hmm. so they're gonna have to, have to join my summer class mm -hmm. to resolve incomplete by taking mm -hmm. the exam. But if that's an hour and a half exam, that's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's my worry is that we don't have exam periods. Mm -hmm. So am I having to give two exams on uh, the Wednesday and the Thursday in the last week in order to make that a complete mm -hmm. final exam? What can I do in this case? I know you can extend beyond the class window. Um, it's just a matter of whether that runs into any other finals they may be taking in our classes, you know, classes they would normally have scheduled then. So that may be a, a way of, you know, polling students a little bit, surveying them and trying to understand if, if they have that flexibility and just making accommodations for maybe those that have conflicts with other classes. So then that will be a lot of coordinating. <laughs> I can anticipate that. I yeah. Don't know if you're awesome. um, I mean, that is the, that's the scheduled time period for, for finals, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so if, I think going if, over Zoom. In the future, we can have uh, exam period where students can expect before they enroll to be available yeah. instead of me having to ask them, call them. Right. Right. Can you do an exam on a Friday? Can you do an exam on a Saturday? Yeah. Um,
I think it's one of the challenges of summer and, and the sessions ending and the next one starting and every, like the timeline of being crunched. But yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Yeah, Doug. So this question is about um, my summer session D course has 31 students at the moment. I can get a reading grader if there are 35 enrolled. Is it reasonable to expect another four enrollments before session D starts? Session D? Yeah, I would say so. Um, but also, there, it, it depends on the department and what your department is saying, but sometimes there's a little bit of flexibility. You can sometimes reduce the percentage of the GSI or the reader a little bit um, to kind of get to that, that correct ratio. Um, but yeah, I think four before session D is reasonable. Of course, it depends on the class and things and how enrollment's been going, but based on how many are in there now, it seems like that that's very doable. Yeah? I'm not sure if you addressed this. Um, since we have some potentially pre-college students and whatnot, uh, do we have the same summer campus resources for like writing, uh, tutors, mm -hmm. and whatnot? Are you still on campus this summer? Yeah, pretty much everything is, is still available to students this summer. Mm -hmm. The Student Learning Center has dedicated summer um, staff support. So you might want to reach out to SLC ahead of time and see which tutors that they have in SLC are attached to social sciences, humanities, and sciences. And you can get that contact information right now and plug it into your syllabus. And because I'm hoping to use these courses as, as a tool for mm -hmm. But I'm assuming folks who aren't familiar with these courses, they're not used to these tools. Is there also someone at the Student Learning Center that helps to people on how to navigate these courses? So there are some resources through um, CTL. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking of ULS. Yeah, CTL. So um, kind of on the their larger website, I know there's some like tutorials for navigating the courses yeah. that students can watch that can be really helpful. And that's teaching.berkeley.edu. Center for teaching and learning. And then um, I wanted to jump back to the question Doug just asked. So if you're, um, and I know there was another question earlier about, about course minimums. If you're concerned about enrollment or you want to attract additional students to your classes, we have a number of marketing resources that are available. Mm -hmm. um, we've put them out to your departments, but I'm also happy to share them with you. So I'm putting my email back up here, alexcole at berkeley.edu. If you want to email me after, I can send you that sheet, and it just suggests some different avenues um, that may be helpful to pick up enrollments at this point. So there's like a Twitter feed that students are looking at. We have some social media platforms that we utilize. We can make a poster for your class that you can put out and, and kind of advertise. So there's some things like that if you're if you're wanting to pick up a few more before your your session starts. The poster that says "Don't worry about the meetings." <laughs> <laughs> or like motivational, you can do it. <laughs> so student drops, so I can already get done. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? Thank you for all of your wonderful questions. That's great. Thanks so much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. A lot of gratitude. Thank you so much. Um, my heart and soul is in teaching AC, and then I also coordinate um, reading and composition courses that are taught by the graduate student instructors in my department, as well as teach RNC courses of my own. So I've taught both RNC in person, um, you know, during the summer and. AC courses in person during the summer. Now I do a large sort of asynchronous online course. Um, and really more than anything, what I would like to do for the next hour or however much time we have is rework whatever we need and adapt to whatever will be most helpful for you all. So I know that this was um, you know, talked about as kind of a guide to best practices um, for teaching in the summer. I am extremely tired. I am sure that you are too. I just think it's important to give voice to that and say that out loud, right? Those of us who have been teaching, we just barely turned in grades. Um, now it's Friday and you're all, you know, giving me an hour or something of your time. So however things run today, I just really want to emphasize, you know, please interrupt anytime, ask questions. Um, we can redirect depending on what you'll find most helpful, most useful for you. Um, so I also tried to design today's workshop um, so that we think about the best practices that we're already using as teachers. 
Um, I think something that's really important to acknowledge about teaching in summer is that yes, absolutely, with summer instruction, we face a particular set of constraints, right? Uh, we have much fewer weeks, much fewer class sessions, fewer time to spend with students. We have to be very, very deliberate about assessments, very, very deliberate about assignments, whether those be readings or otherwise, even though I think getting students to read is important and if they see a lot of reading, they shouldn't run away from the class and drop it immediately. We have a lot of constraints um, when it comes to teaching in summer, but I would also suggest that we can sort of reframe these as opportunities because these are um, sort of ideal moments in which to reflect on how we teach, why we teach, and how we can sort of maximize every single element um, in terms of the pedagogy that we're practicing over the summer. So um, something else that I wanted to do with today's workshop was make it interactive. So I've sent around a handout. Um, I hope that this gives us an opportunity to, you know, draw. <laughs> Draw, write, okay? Um, I didn't bring my crayons. Most students know me as the person who brings around a big bag of crayons and colored pencils. I didn't have time to pick those up from my office, but feel free, you know, to as we work through this handout to fill it out however you see fit, however it's helpful for you. And don't even fill it out if you feel like it's something that maybe you'd like to look back at or something that you don't feel is particularly relevant to you and your experience of the workshop today. All right, so as I already said, um, teaching in summer isn't, I see it, fundamentally different from what we already do. Good teaching is good teaching. Um, but I do think that, as I already mentioned, summer instruction presents us with some unique opportunities to really get back to basics when it comes to our teaching. Um, and so in this way, I wanted to start today by just sort of revisiting some very, very um, central, I would say, pedagogy fundamentals. So we're gonna actually start with learning goals, okay, which are often known as learning objectives. Okay, I don't like the word objective personally, so I like the word goal. So we're just gonna switch it out for that. Um, one thing that I can say about summer instruction, because it is so compressed, right? Because we are rushed, students are rushed, yet we still have to meet the same curricular guidelines. It's even more critical, I think, that we identify our learning goals very, very early on, and then plan around those. Plan however possible for us and our students to meet those goals and to facilitate our students' success in meeting those goals. So why am I starting with learning goals? What are these? Okay, this is probably like pedagogy 101 for all of you, but I sometimes find it really helpful to just go back to basics, as I said. So this is on um, the in the little gray box on your handout, okay? Um, so learning objectives are essentially ways that we articulate, okay, or as I say, I call them learning goals, moments for us to articulate what do we most want students to learn or be able to do by the end of our course, okay? So learn or be able to do by the end of the course. If you're also working to establish learning goals for a particular class session, a particular unit, then you can modify that and ask yourself, okay, what is it that I want students to learn or be able to do by the end of this one hour session, for example, right? You can also reset this in terms of units, I'm sure, right? Or modules, as you're all familiar. Why are learning goals or learning objectives so important? Because as instructors, they ground us, and then I would also say they help us ground our students. Um, you know, as we've been reiterating over and over, summer happens fast. We move through, um, you know, we try to attain the same curricular goals as we do, do during the regular semester, but we're really, really rushed um, in a lot of senses. Part of what I find is beneficial about taking pause and thinking about our learning goals is that it helps me sort of quell the anxiety about being so rushed and helps me feel more centered in terms of, well, this is what we're here to do. This is what we're here to do. This is what my goals are for my students in this particular class, in this particular term. And I can always sort of sit down and reevaluate on that basis. Um, and I highly, highly recommend having some course level learning goals that you actually put at the very top of the syllabus right? Three or four, maybe maximum of five 
sort of list of concepts, topics, or skills that, as our Center for Teaching and Learning says, right, can guide student learning and add clarity to students' learning experiences. So now I'm reading from this little gray box. By designing the course from a list of three to six course level outcomes, instructors can provide students with a clear set of expectations and students will be better prepared to demonstrate their learning in a way that aligns with their instructor's expectations. Okay, so just a quick reminder about what learning goals are and also why they're so important. As I said, why I think they're particularly important given the compressed amount of time we're working with in a summer session. Um, when it comes to writing, right, articulating learning goals, I also feel like it's really helpful to remind myself of these three pointers. Again, I'm borrowing from our own Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, Well-written learning objectives should be student-centered, actionable, and measurable, okay? And I think it's worth sort of taking a moment to read what they mean by all of these student-centered. Focus on what students should be able to know or to do rather than what you plan to teach, okay? So notice how we're shifting here from, I'm the instructor, this is what I want to teach or this is what I need to teach, to instead a student-centered focus, right? Um, what is it that I, I want students to be able to do? What is it that I want them to be able to learn? And that is sort of the starting point for how you plan all aspects of your course. So student-centered, also actionable. So well-written learning objectives will identify concrete actions and behaviors that students are expected to demonstrate. So concrete, right, a little bit of a tricky word. You might also think in terms of specificity, right? So instead of just sort of giving students this sort of amorphous list of all of these things that you want them to learn about or topics that you'd like them to engage in some way, one of the ways that you can help make your learning goals sound actionable and be actionable for you as an instructor and for your students is to frame them in terms of active verbs. Okay, so if you're thinking about what you want students to learn or do, you might think about, right, engage, review, discuss, uh, debate, um, you know, uh, synthesize. Okay, so try to think in terms of active verbs that you can, again, use to ground yourself and then also ground your students. And then last but not least, measurable. Oh yeah, go ahead. What would be an example of something like talk to you in terms of like the active verbs? Um, to... I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Like you said use like active verbs? Yeah. Like, as opposed to, like, what would be an example of things like talk to you? Um, well, I think it's active verbs and it's also, you know, trying to be as specific or as it says here, as concrete as possible. Um, so, if you use a word like know or understand, you know, understand um, the lasting impacts of slavery on the, geog the mapping of New York City. I'm just giving you an example, you know, from my own. Um, understand, like, what does that mean, right? What, what, how does a student read that and have a sense of, oh, so this is, my goal, this is, these are the learning goals that we have for this particular class, unit, course. Um, instead, we implicit in that goal, if we use action verbs and we also use specific sort of concrete words, then we help students see not just what the goal is, but also how they can get there. So that's where I would say understand, right? Even discuss can be a very difficult one if what comes after it is very big, right? Um, so you want, to, I, I'm happy to share, there's actually a list of um, active verbs that I can share with everyone. I think it's still available through the Center for Teaching and Learning, um, but looking over some of those might also help answer your question. Yeah, any other questions so far? And what was your name? Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah. Well, just responding that, to that question too, like, for, like even like, this is really being very basic, but like, verbs in a passive voice, like students will be exposed to. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Versus students will debate, Generate, right? Yeah. And then even why do we, I mean, this is maybe, I'll get a little too personal here, but why do we talk about them in the abstract? Students will be able to um, I actually like to write my syllabus in a language that says, like, you, right? Um, you, or talk about our class community, right? Or students in this class. 
um, you know, that, that of course is language that um, might not work depending on, you know, your own particular discipline, your own particular department. Um, but even just helping students see that our goal is actually not just to relay information or expose them to material, um, but to connect with them personally and that we're invested in their own personal learning experience, I think can even come through in the language of our syllabus and also the language of our learning goals. Can I underline that too? Oh, of course. Is that, um, when we talk about inclusive classroom design, mm -hmm. one of the first ways that that gets really broken is through this language that we incorporate into the syllabus. You know, how do we present kindness, care, personality, personality and relationship? So those, yeah. those personal statements feel as if they're already developing a structure that we can then um, think about engaging later on. And then it makes me think about the learning goals as a, possi a possibility of co-construction. Absolutely. So what does it mean then to engage the student in thinking about co-constructing their own design of hopes and expectations in the class? Yeah. And given the short amount of time we have in summer, I find that it can be difficult to build as many opportunities for that co-construction in. Um, but one of the strategies that I've seen many instructors on this campus use effectively is you, know, the, you can't necessarily um, dedicate a class session to having students outline their learning goals for the entire course, right? We, we just don't have that time to give. Um, that's something that I like to do within the context of a semester long reading and composition class. You know, I can come in and say, this is a reading and composition class. This is supposed to teach you writing fundamentals. What do you think you want to learn here? What do you think we should focus on? Um, and I can dedicate a whole you know, half hour, 40 minutes to that. We don't have that kind of time in summer. But you can bring in that co-construction in terms of you know, having students reflect on what they've learned and also asking them to articulate learning goals for the coming class session or for the coming week even. So this is where I highly recommend using um, exit tickets or like anonymous check-ins with students. You can do this via Google Forms, right? Just be careful, right? That if you do want it to be anonymous that you don't have the Google Form set up so that it's collecting um, students' email information. Um, you can also just do this through slips of paper. So I have, you know, a slip of paper that I, I, well, a sheet of paper that I cut up into multiple little slips, and it just has two questions. I use these exit tickets um, sometimes very, very frequently, sometimes not as frequently, depending on the sense I'm getting from the class community about how the course is going for everyone. Um, but it has two questions. One is something I learned today was. Um, or something that interested me about today's class was, right? So if maybe learning, right, this question of what did you learn can sometimes make, people, make students feel like they're taking a quiz. So something interesting, right, fascinating, revealing, you can use different words, um, and then a blank space that I learned was, and then also a question or concern that I have is, and sometimes you'll get questions about sort of the logistics of a course. Um, when are we going to get the, the study guide for the midterm exam, right? When is our next major writing assignment due, et cetera? But then other times you'll also, you've, because it's such an open question, you'll get questions about the content. Um, you'll get questions about, like, you know, why, why is it so important to Yi Fu Tuan to distinguish between space and place? Again, I'm just kind of giving you examples, drawing from my own, um, the, my, the course I'm teaching this summer. But... And those are also really great moments for students to be involved in their own learning. It's a way of kind of bringing in the co-construction. Um, and then you read through those exit tickets, you can bring in some of those questions. You can also, as I said, use some sort of exit ticket where um, you ask students specifically to talk about um, a learning goal that they have for the coming class or for the coming week or, you know, something that a learning goal that they have that they'd like to try to meet before the end of the semester. Um, if you do these, you know, sort of exit tickets via Google form or by collecting sheets of paper, it can be something that only takes a couple of minutes or even something that you can ask students to do at home um, with, you know, five, ten minutes of their time and then it gives you something that you can build in 
to the class. It gives you the opportunity to make adjustments, um, to make the learning experience more personal and address some of the particular goals and experiences of the students you have. Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes it can be challenging. Yes. Uh, that may require to redesign the course. Mm -hmm. So if I ask uh, uh, this type of question, yeah. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. uh, we can collect this, uh, uh, this type of uh, opinions to uh, redesign the course for the next summer, and not, not for that this summer. I think that's a great point. There might be a difference between the kinds of questions we ask students on a midterm evaluation, for example, where we're asking them, okay, so we have a few weeks left. Are there any changes in thinking about the constraints that we're under, um, thinking about the amount of time we have left, um, in some cases thinking about the fact that this course is online asynchronous and totally built into B courses in ways that I cannot go in and easily alter. You know, those might not be the, the kinds of questions that you ask on a midterm evaluation, but rather um, on an end of term evaluation. I'd love to hear your feedback about what we can change for this the next time I teach this course. So the, the course I'm teaching is uh, also taught in the fall or the spring, and I'm teaching it in the summer. So for yes. the fall or spring, it's a regular uh, session mm -hmm. and we have more time. Absolutely. So yeah. if I want to teach the same content for the summer, it sometimes becomes uh, overwhelming for a student. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they often say that uh, rather than focusing on too many theories, we focus on uh, a smaller number of uh, theories, mm -hmm. but yeah. that that is like uh, against the uh, uh, course objective because right. the same course will be taught in the uh, spring mm -hmm. or in the fall, sure. and mm -hmm. these two uh, groups will learn completely two different things. Mm -hmm. So this Absolutely. is uh, like a big challenge that I face every time. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people nodding their heads, <laughs> you know, in, in agreement. Mm -hmm. It is part of the, the challenge of summer. I would encourage you, you know, to, to think about um, excerpting readings whenever possible, right, in order to ensure that students, you know, have a, a snapshot, shall we say, right, of a particular theory or a particular theorist's work. Um, but maybe they can read a few paragraphs that they can sort of delve into more deeply than reading 20 or 30 pages of a full article, um, right? So just trying to think of ways um, so that it's quality over quantity, but I agree with you completely. I, I actually just finished teaching um, a spring in-person version of my summer online asynchronous course um, and it feels like a completely different experience um, absolutely different and yet the curricular guidelines especially for an American cultures course that I have to meet are the same that that can't change right um, so can I mention yeah so so one thing before I forget is that there's a free um, app on campus through Centre for Teaching and Learning called Poll Everywhere. So to this point of these exit slips, if you want to do something in the class, if it's an online course in particular, um, Poll Everywhere is a really good tool um, and it can create anonymous feedback. So it's something that catches comment quickly. And the other is um, to the data that was shared by Alex, thinking about the idea of where the work in summer lands. We often give our students in the regular semesters a lot of homework, as in homework, but thinking about the relationship of students to their work lives during the summer, which is normally heavier than in the academic year. And often off-campus work, not on-campus work, is work study students. So part of the arrangement I've heard that faculty try to think about is to how to create homework options inside the classroom mm -hmm. so that the homework is, is, is relayed differently. It becomes in-class assignments, it then becomes project-based assignments, maybe for collective learning and not just individual assignments. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I was thinking about when you were talking about kind of the speed but also the manner of how our students show up for the sure. summer. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point too. Um, there are many things that we assign that can be turned into a 15-minute, you know, pair activity, for 
example, or a small group activity. Or in some cases, um, what we are able to do is at least have students start the quote unquote homework in the classroom together, right? Also in order to emphasize you know, the collective learning experience and then um, have them finish it, right? Um, on their own or working in pairs, right? Um, Google Docs, et cetera, at home. So that would be a way of you know, possibly adapting some of the assignments. Um, I would say reduce the reading load wherever possible. And for me, I know that's, that, I mean, that should be a bumper sticker, but I, I have such trouble with that because as soon as I take away this poem, as soon as I take away this novel, then I feel like, well, students are gonna miss out on this or that or the other. Um, but this is actually why I personally have found it really helpful to come back to my learning goals even when in, when evaluating do I really need this here right or maybe I provide it to students and make it optional so that I know it's there I know it's available to them they can look it over they can engage it if it speaks to them but I'm also trying to keep these larger concerns in mind about how much energy how much time do students have um, and how can we also ensure that they're getting a quality experience even though we are expected to meet the same curricular requirements as we're doing during the normal semester in a very, very compressed amount of time. So maybe this is a good moment to kind of take pause um, and turn to the handout. Um, so actually what I wanted us all to do was, um, you can either do this on your own or you know, you can turn to the person next to you and work in a pair if you prefer, okay? We are gonna start kind of individually, but then hopefully we'll be able to generate some discussion and some interaction moving forward. But I'd like you to look at part one, so above the gray box included on your handout. Um, I'm gonna ask you to actually think about your own summer course. So what do you most want students to learn or to be able to do, okay? Um, don't worry too much right now about framing these in terms of, you know, the language that you'll use on your syllabus. Think about this as a moment to think and work in draft mode and just try to articulate for yourself. Here are one or two of the learning goals that I think I want to orient my own work toward in the coming couple of weeks. So let's take just like three minutes to just jot down some ideas, draw pictures, as I said, if you prefer. And then we're going to come back and share and refine a bit together. All right, okay, thank you all. It was so nice to hear a lot of voices moving around in the room. Would anybody be willing to share with us? Okay, and you don't have to have the, per the perfectly articulated learning goal, but if you'd just be willing to share with us something that emerged through your discussion, um, something that you think would be helpful to share with your students and use to frame your own lesson planning, course planning process as we move forward. <laughs> Everybody was so talkative a second ago. Yeah, thank you. Sure, I'll start it off. Um, yeah, we had a great discussion. Um, one thing that, well, we, we did go through the uh, the articulating learning goals, uh, but the I think the thing that really came out of our discussion was that um, first of all, you can't make all the students happy. Um, and <laughs> that so, can't be a goal. So, right, right, right. Happiness is not Please the goal everyone. in this case. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. Um, but th so they, so they appreciate, students appreciate clear expectations at the very beginning. For example, saying this course has to be intense, this course has to be rigorous, you are expected to, you know, dedicate, you know, your, your time and effort to this, to this course. Um, and just letting them know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So in particular, the fact, you know, this is fast paced, this is intensive. Mm -hmm. um, another recommendation I can give, I was going to bring this up later, um, but try to figure out a kind of pattern for the weeks of your course. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then stick to it as you move through the summer session, you know, with few exceptions, inevitably you'll have some you know, extraordinary assignments. You don't have every week, you just have once, et cetera. But, I find a lot of colleagues who, you know, they'll meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a very, very long amount of time. 
right, with their students during the summer session. Monday has a particular, you know, sort of slant to it, or it has a particular goal in terms of this is the day when we come together and we talk about the reading that we did over the weekend, right? And we really work through it together. Um, then Wednesday might be a day where there's more of a lecture. Um, there's, you know, slides, there's information presented, and the instructor takes more of a lead in terms of providing historical information, right? working students through problem sets, whatever that may be. And then Friday might look like something different, okay? So as long as all of those pieces are fitting together, mm -hmm. then it can be very helpful for students to be able, especially if we're telling them that summer is intense, right? That it's fast paced, can help them settle into that fast paced um, nature of the summer. If we help them understand, so this is what we're gonna be doing this day. This is what we're gonna be doing this day. Or this is your discussion board post is always due Wednesday by midnight, right? And just sort of having this pattern that you can play out, at least in terms of core assignments um, that can you know, work through all of the weeks of whatever summer session you're teaching. Yeah. Other thoughts, learning goals that you all wanted to share or even challenges that you faced when you were working to articulate these? Yeah, go ahead. I was talking with you about this, but sure. I'm teaching like a math-based course, mm -hmm. and so like the the course structure is basically dictated by a textbook, and so it seemed like uh, yeah, I guess one challenge was coming up with something like useful to convey in terms of like expectations because it's like just solving problems from the textbook. But one thing we talked about is maybe still making it explicit, like oh, these are concepts you are expected to be able to solve problems with. Mm -hmm. um, even if they're like already in the textbook. Yeah, and, and I think also framing them as we talked about, right? Um, maybe utilize these tools or these yeah. methods in order to solve these kinds of problems. So kind of breaking it down a little bit more for students so it's not just a list of headings, but also giving them some clues, right? As to how you're gonna be asking them to put the, the methods, right? Um, together with whatever you know information or problems they're being presented with. Anybody else want to jump in? As I said, also challenges that you came so across. Actually, we have some commonalities in what we're teaching. So she's teaching a reading at Comp course. I'm teaching a course on the Quran and its interpretation. Oh wow! So uh, we were just talking about she, for example, started talking about how she's interested in. Uh, one of the goals is that students should be able to articulate what they're thinking. And you have this perennial challenge that sometimes things are very clear in our mind, but when it's put into words, words tend to obfuscate those things. So it's yeah. for them to for initially just recognize that there is that challenge just because the utter words are like words, they don't explicate meaning as easily. Uh, and then the other thing that I brought in was uh, I would like to do that, but in my course, but and also something uh, akin to deep reading mm -hmm. that they should be able to put text in context. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching them a course that introduces that to a text that's 1500, 1500 years old and then they're reading yeah. both modern and pre-modern commentaries. They really have to be uh, introduced to the idea of context and, uh, and historical method uh, but more importantly that writing also involves uh, a particular style. Mm -hmm. So that could also be a way of decentering how they think about their own use of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Did you want to build on that a little? Yeah, actually, I was trying to build on what uh, Therese was saying that, yes, um, part of my goal will be to get the students to um, find their voices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, how to get them to articulate that and also to um, learn from their readings. I mean, Imbibe um, styles from the writers that they would be uh, encountering. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this also makes me think about um, why the the language of goals are sort of orienting our, ourselves around goals as teachers can be so important and so helpful at this particular stage. Because for me, for example, right now I'm about a month out. Yes, a month out. Oh no. 
from um, starting my, my online AC course. And this is the perfect moment for me to just look through everything with my particular goals in mind. So if, you know, articulation, if voice, expression of voice, recognition of voice is something that's really important to you, then, um, you know, you can think about whether or not that is a goal that you want to have for yourself um, or also one that you might want to include right in, in the syllabus. So I think being very explicit with students about our learning goals is, is helpful to us, but it's also helpful to them. So just a couple of quick reminders before we, we move on. Um, but why, why am I, by going over this, why am I asking us to bring back, to, co to go back to basics? I think because learning goals, they, they put student learning at the forefront, right? So remember I talked a little bit about shifting the focus from, I'm the teacher, this is what I'm going to teach, or this is the material I'm going to convey, to what are my students going to learn? What do I hope they're able to do? Um, so put student learning at the forefront. It can be very empowering for students, I believe. It also helps us as instructors be very intentional about how we design lessons, units, and then also courses overall. We've kind of been, notice how we've been moving between sort of, we might think of them as um, learning goals of, of different levels, right? In some cases, they might be course level. In some cases, they might be more specific, um, you know, to a particular day, a particular unit, et cetera. So keep that in mind. And then this is related to the, the last point that I wanted to draw out about the emphasis on learning goals that I've made today, that I think they help us evaluate our courses on the big picture and the small picture levels. Okay, so think about constantly having these goals to ground you and then being able to sort of zoom in and out on different pieces of your course, um, as well as enabling the students to zoom in and out, okay, and to move through, as we know, right, a lot of material very quickly but still be able to remind themselves, oh, this is what I'm here for. This is what my goal is. This is what we're, we're doing in this course, right? It can be a very, um, it can be very comforting, very grounding for students, particularly given the fast paced nature of the summer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I learned one very important thing about like uh, doing the homework in the class. Mm. So this way uh, I'm thinking because uh, my uh, topic is uh, very general, so anybody can uh, cheat on this. Like nowadays, uh, chat GPT is a big problem. So if I assign them to uh, uh, write it, write an assignment on a particular theory, it is very easy to uh, just uh, ask chat GPT to write that theory. Mm -hmm. But uh, to avoid that, uh, we can engage the students in the class mm -hmm. and just uh, uh, the idea that day-to-day uh, -day progression. Mm -hmm. So, like so starting from yes. the first day, by, by the end of uh, the week, we can complete one assignment. Absolutely. I like that idea very much. Anyway. Yeah. And then there's, there's also, so I teach a, a lot of um, literary theory, and it can be very helpful to start those conversations in the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. To give students some reading, but as I said earlier, kind of highly excerpted. <laughs> Um, if, if possible, I know that's hard to say because we don't want to sacrifice things as instructors, but then also it can be very time consuming to right, decide exactly what parts of the text we want to focus on. But giving students some of the reading and then creating some space in the classroom for them to grapple with that theory so that it isn't just that, oh, I could look this up on the internet or you know, a, a machine could produce an, an answer or a definition. Instead, it can be, well, what do I think is at stake in this theory? What is this theory really about? What are some of the potential assumptions built into this theory? What is this theory overlooking? Who might it be silencing or overlooking, right? Um, and that, I think, is something that not only a machine can't produce, but it's also those kinds of questions and activities are best to happen you know, within the context of collaboration and conversation when we open up spaces for students to try to make those theories meaningful to them in some way useful, um, not just ask them to kind of memorize a definition and then figure out how they might implement or apply it. Yeah. Are right, any other questions, comments before we plow ahead? Yeah, well, go in ahead. In my case, I have a group of discussing, um, and I have like a lot of concern that I would think of try to solve how they move forward, but I do have an issue because in my class there's a fieldwork component uh, and students uh -huh. have to complete 30 hours of 
uh, field work. So in this wow. case, like I'm kind of yeah. worried about how that's gonna look <laughs> with a six week uh, course. So yeah, that's an issue that I have there. So if you have like some ideas. Well, it, it does sound like um, creating some sort of scaffolding so that students don't do it all at the last minute. Um, creating, you know, some small low stakes assignments early on so that students start planning like they know that this is a requirement for the course, but also conducting field work is something that takes a lot of intention, a lot of planning. Um, particularly if you want to do it in, in a respectful and ethical way. Mm -hmm. So we don't want them to be doing it, you know, right before it's, it's due, right? Um, or, you know, a few days before. In fact, you might have some kind of check-ins mm -hmm. built into the course so that maybe an initial assignment is, where do you think you're going to conduct your field work? I'm, I'm, I'm not in your discipline, so please excuse me if I'm just mm -hmm. kind of like throwing out some yeah. ideas here, but... Where are you going to conduct it? Um, who do you need to reach out to? Um, are there any kinds of special permissions that you know are required? Um, forms of you know consent, but I, I also mean permissions in terms of if you're going to be conducting field work, you know, are you gonna, are you approaching it in a thoughtful and respectful way, um, not just in terms of legal consent, shall we say, right? So just kind of having this almost like a questionnaire that asks students to start planning ahead right away. And then maybe a week later or two weeks later, having them produce a check-in. Have you connected with the person, persons, organization, site, right, et cetera? Have you identified the site? Um, just kind of asking them to kind of constantly get a little bit more specific mm -hmm. and um, make those actually required assignments that are worth some form of credit. Um, maybe they're complete incomplete, you know, um, but it also helps you as an instructor check in with them in terms of their progress and open up the possibility for conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're struggling in, in any potential way, maybe they haven't started, maybe they're having difficulty connecting, uh, maybe they're having difficulty, you know, choosing the site. They have so many different ones that they want to work with. There can be so many things. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have ethical concerns. You know, that's great advice coming there. And, and building from that, so we run the community engagement, scholar, community based scholarship program in AC. Um, so check out the community engagement link on the American Coaches website. There's a faculty toolkit, um, which is not only advice for faculty working with partners, but how to create assignments that can support the scaffolding that mm -hmm. Nina is uh, talking about. And then finally, and this applies to anybody who's, who's working not just in an AC course, but is thinking about engage, engaging with community partners, you can apply for a course development grant. So um, some of the resources necessary to do that field work in terms of um, transportation grants, uh, we have created Uber credits for um, students to get to sites. Um, oh, wow. Also, we really want to support our partners in the honor area so that we reward and recognize the value of their partnerships. So um, if you look on the Community Engagement Scholarship website on AC, our pages on AC, um, hopefully that can help. Yeah. I think overall scaffolding is kind of advice that I would offer, whether or not you have this kind of situation where your students are required to, mm -hmm. you know, to engage in a pretty intense sort of project that requires a lot of planning. Um, and again, within the context of the summer, I think scaffolding within the context of summer assignments is even more important um, because when you hit, you know, so my, my summer session is eight weeks long. By the time I hit week six, it's very, very difficult for me, um, as much as I might want to support a student and help them negotiate a difficult situation, if they're running very behind or they're really struggling with the material, um, that it's very hard for me to support them and intervene um, in, in a productive way at that point. So I feel like the scaffolding helps me as an instructor as in that it allows me to have sort of check-ins with the students, even if it is just a credit, no credit, you know, sort of form assignment, but just to make sure that they keep thinking about, you know, these sort of long-term goals that we have or these long-term requirements that we're asked to meet. 
Um, and then it also helps the students because it creates, um, you know, a, the scaffolding creates a situation where hopefully they're able to approach the assignment more deliberately, more intentionally, right, instead of pushing it off to the end, or in some cases also letting anxiety, you know, settle in and, and making it hard for themselves to, to motivate, right, and be able to complete the, the assignment. All right, um, so we don't have that much more time. Um, so I do just kind of wanna briefly walk you through um, what you might do at home if you would like to, and then throw out just some, I think some of the tips that I uh, collected for all of you I already shared or they emerged in our discussion, but there are just a couple more that I would like to, to share. Um, so notice how if you look at the bottom of the first side of your handout, part two, practicing reverse design. In pedagogy language, this is also known as backward design, um, but I don't like the word backward. <laughs> so I use reverse instead, which to me works a lot better. If you flip the page over, I think you'll get a sense of sort of why it is that I actually asked us to go back to basics and start with learning goals for today, but also where you can take this from here. So in terms of a very, very brief introduction to reverse or what's more commonly known as backward design, the idea is that as instructors, we start by articulating our learning goals. Then from there, we create the learning activities and from there, we create the learning assessments, okay? So notice how this is a kind of inverse or a reverse of um, the approach that many of us have been taught in the past, which is the, or it was the kind of experience that we had in education, teach to the test, right? Or be taught to the test. The test, doing well on the test is the goal. The instructor sort of makes that the ultimate goal and then backs up from there in order to design the learning activities and also the learning assessments. And by assessments, right? You might think of exams, you might think of quizzes, but you might think of any, any kind of assessment that you're using um, to grade students, right? To, to in some way measure or get a sense of whether they're learning um, and they're, they're meeting the learning goals that you've articulated for the course. So in starting with our learning goals today, I kind of asked you to put yourself in that mindset. And what I would recommend doing on your own time is you don't have to start from scratch, right? I sort of started off today by saying, I don't think teaching in summer is fundamentally different. And I know that all of us care very deeply about teaching and we put a lot of thought into the teaching that we do during the regular semester. There's no reason that we can't bring that life, that passion, right? That experience to our summer teaching. So I'm not asking you to kind of rethink and start from zero but I do think reorienting ourselves in terms of our learning goals and then re-evaluating the different learning activities and learning assessments can be a great place to go from here. So we're not gonna have time to do it all together as I'd hoped, but if you would like to work through it with me one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, or maybe you connected with someone today that you'd like to work through this with, please um, feel free to contact me, feel free to contact each other. And then maybe just also reach out if you have any questions, right, as you kind of move through this process. So um, what I do want to talk about before we head out is this question of fostering student engagement. It looks like I got logged off here. Give me one second. So um, in terms of student engagement, we hit on some of the advice that I wanted to share with you. Um, a couple of just really sort of brief pointers that I'd offer before we leave today um, that we haven't yet talked about. One is to try to mix it up and engage students with different modalities. Um, so whenever possible, you know, and this isn't always possible given the limits of our course, right, um, our discipline, etc. Don't worry, it doesn't work. I can just, mm -hmm. I don't know, it doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, engaging them, trying to provide not just, you know, visual aids, for example, um, to accompany your lecture or handouts to accompany a class meeting, um, but also think in terms of like Google home pages. So, for example, if you are going to ask students to get together and do some sort of activity together in your classroom or start a bit of the homework working together in the classroom, then you can have them work through the collaborations 
tab on B courses to create a Google Doc um, that they can then build and work through collaboratively. They can start it in the classroom and then continue collaborating if you would like. And, oh, you have the magic touch. No. Mm -hmm. um, or of course, they um, you know they can complete an initial activity within the context of the classroom. But I've started using a lot of um, Google homepages. And in fact, sometimes I have a link to a homepage that I use to start off a class session um, in that it gives everybody a place to, as I say, go home. It's like, what are we here for today? What are we doing today? Um, sometimes I'll even have you know, the description of the activities that I'm asking students to work through in terms of group work or collaborations. But sometimes I'll also have, you know, images, timelines, um, you know, particularly important slides from the slideshow that I'm going to walk them through, just so that they have a chance to look, you know, and, and engage in different ways the material that we're going to be working for that particular day. Yeah. Um, especially for the collaborations point, yeah. uh, oftentimes, maybe more so with like math-based classes, it's helpful when people like have each other's contact info so they can talk outside of class. Absolutely. Um, Often, obviously, at the start of the semester or at the start of the summer, people don't know each other, mm -hmm. and like the more social kids have an easier time, like you know, getting to know people, getting people's contact info. Yeah. Uh, and they form, you know, like message, Facebook group chats and all. Um, but like the less social kids, maybe have like a harder time doing that. Yeah. If so something I've thought about is maybe like breaking people up into groups and like suggesting to them, hey guys, feel free to like exchange, like yeah, I, like Facebook. Is that something that's like? Um, I would, so I can't speak to that, I'm no lawyer, <laughs> um, but I can say that I break students up into lots of different kinds of groups using B courses, and doing that, um, I see it as having multiple functions, but one is that B courses has become even more central in terms of students on the Cal campus. So the more that they are familiar with B courses and how it works and they can sort of make it work well for them, the better. So I, I try to kind of build everything into B courses since that's what's used across campus. And I think especially for students um, to have as much experience using that platform as possible is, is better. Um, but the other thing is that students can interact with each other via B courses without sharing any personal information. So they wouldn't have to you know, provide Facebook information or even a personal email or a phone number or anything like that. That makes sense. Yeah. I guess like in my experience, people just like, don't use, don't like talk to each other via I B know. courses. Yeah. And it's like a, like if, if we're like, oh, you can talk to each other via B courses, like nobody's No, they won't do it. That's why I actually um, create groups, okay. you know, in B courses. And that way um, it's really easy for them to connect with each other. Okay. And then I don't know the size of your course. If you have 200 students, I would imagine this would be very difficult, but um, you can then sort of ask students to be in touch with you if um, you prefer, if they prefer to be in a different group, maybe they have connected with the people who sit around them and they want to form a study group with that, you know, group of people, then you can reorganize B courses in order to make that happen. You just use the people tab. Okay. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Do you want to? My advice is not to encourage students to share personal information with each other. Okay. Because if a student in your class harasses another student in that class with their personal phone number, yeah. and then that student says, my teacher told me to share that uh, phone okay. number, Fair. you're on the hook for that. Fair. Yeah. Fair. yeah, B courses keeps everything. Um, I think you were gonna add something too. Sorry, I, I forgot your I was gonna ask, how do, you, how do you create the groups, but you just said the people tab. The people tab, yeah. Yeah, and I, um, I'm happy to, like, I'm going to be heading out of town as of next week, so I might not be able to meet with you in person, but I'm happy to do it over Zoom, or we can meet in person next week if anybody wants to work through any aspect of what I've been talking about. But yeah, it's people tab, and then as I said, for a particularly large course, it could be difficult because you have to manually move people around if you want to be very intentional. Um, there are ways, there are buttons you can hit so that it, it'll be like a random, you know, you say put 10 people in a group or put five people in a group. Um, Would you say is it kind of like um, the breakout room and Zoom feature? Um, it isn't in that it puts them in a group that you, that then is stable for the rest of the oh, so course unless you move things around. Okay. Yeah. So it can be randomized or you can 
Yes. We cannot do that through app discussion. Um, through a B, B courses discussion? The, like grouping people on app discussion. That's something we can do. You can do that. Yes, absolutely. It's just that typically the discussion groups would be significantly larger than what we'd want a study group to be, for example, or, or even a reading group. Yeah. In my experience, yeah. um, B courses discussion is a good forum, <laughs> but we need to incentivize the students. Yes. If you assign some marks for that, Mm -hmm. Like say five percent of your course grade will to be assigned for posting discussions on B courses. Absolutely, that works. Yes, and that can also be a great way of getting of preparing students before they come to class. Have them even if it's just post you know the most confusing passage from today's reading, or you know indicate um, you know what you thought was the most compelling concept that we encountered. There, you know, there can be so many different things that, um, and then also make sure that students get credit for it. Um, I think it's important that we not just incentivize engaging the material and coming to class prepared, um, but we also acknowledge for them that this is part of the labor of the course. Um, and so creating these sort of smaller low stakes assignments, um, the courses discussion board that, you know, can take 10 minutes, but serves as a great way for students to demonstrate their engagement with the reading. Um, those can be very, very great assignments to assign within this context. Karina, I think you said I should mention this if it wasn't mentioned, so I'm going to quickly mention it. On the, on the note of collaboration, um, that first image that Karina had up there, um, which was amazing, uh, came out of, of Karina's class this month um, in a program called the Creative Discovery Fellows Program. And essentially what we've built is a toolkit that can be dropped into your B-Course site. So go to the American Culture site, it says Create Discovery Fellows Program. And it's a way to support students using um, lots of different creative tools to develop multimedia platforms, websites, uh, infographics, um, podcasts. And so if you're thinking, and we know that in summer students really respond to group projects and collaboration, but they also need instruction on how to do that. Um, so. If you want to go there, you can drop drop things into your B-Course site that support students. And the center also provides um, work study students who can do a presentation in the class to introduce them to it. So just wanted to quickly mention I that. use the uh, website development tool. Yeah. But for summer classes, uh, it is uh, we have less time. Yes. So you could, you could use some of the Adobe tools that are much more straightforward and don't take a lot of time. Yeah. And again, we have a, really easy student-created instruction that students are the ones who created instruction on how to do them, and they can be dropped into your existing B-Course site. So what's that called? Um, could you quickly pull up American Cultures? Absolutely. Actually, I have you linked here. So this was one of the resources that I wanted to recommend to everybody. I've also included the link at the bottom of our handout. Great, thank you. But where is it in terms of? Uh, it's not on the AC site. See, it says Creative Discovery Fellows Program. There's right there. The light. Okay. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. Yes. Um, this has been a tremendous resource to me and to many instructors. So especially, I mentioned working with multiple modalities. Um, this can be in terms of how we share mm -hmm. material with students, but it can also be in terms of our assessments and the kinds of assignments that we give over the summer. So this, um, we don't have time to work through all of it, but it's a tremendous, tremendous resource in terms of giving students the tools, connecting them with the free software, um, and you know, design knowledge and advice and things like that so that they can actually um, you know, produce their own creative work that you may um, assign for your course. Um, and then last but not least, I know I'm totally out of time, but I did want to encourage everybody to consider using a collaborative annotation software. Um, because I saw that so many of you talked about questions of student engagement, um, you know, in terms of, right, you're, you're thinking about preparing for today and preparing for teaching this summer. I wanted to encourage you to check out um, the collaborative. Could you make the text larger on the I will try. Let's see. Maybe you could just zoom in. Oh, command plus should work. Command plus. Plus sign. Oh, yes. Oh, you data people. I love <laughs> the <laughs> I'm, I'm a language art person, so I'm, 
I have no idea about the computer buttons. Um, this, I'm just pulling up an example so you have a sense of how I've used this in my own course. There um, are a number of benefits to using this kind of annotation software. Um, one is that it makes reading, whatever reading you're assigning in your course, social and makes it, I think, more active for students. Um, it also is free through B courses, so it will save students money. I think this is something really important to consider within the context of the summer when we still have students who are um, struggling you know, with basic needs, with housing costs, with um, food insecurity. This is basically a way for you to take your texts as PDFs, upload them through B courses, make them available to all of your students for free, and then also give them the opportunity to annotate the text. So they can highlight, they can um, put comments, and you can also set it up so that, that they annotate collaboratively. So maybe they're in a group with five other students, for example, and they can see each other's collaboration. Um, they can see each other's annotations, excuse me, and respond to one another. And then this also is very easy to grade within the context of B courses. Um, it's also very important in terms of accessibility. So we use Hypothesis is the program that works with B courses. Um, sorry, I, of course I'm nervous of lack of time and now rushing through this, but I just wanted to show you kind of what this looks like on my end. Um, you'll see Okay, this is a PDF of some excerpts from a reading that I gave students, and I uploaded it as a PDF as long as it's OCR'd, you won't run into any problems. Um, setting up hypothesis is pretty simple. You just go through assignments, but again, I'm happy to walk anybody through this. And then I'm able in the um, guidelines for the assignment, which I just showed you a minute ago, to kind of give students a brief overview of what, the, you know, what, what they're going to be reading. Sometimes it's just historical. Sometimes I ask them questions. Um, sometimes I just provide them with a bit of information. And then here you can actually see um, how this particular student um, highlighted particular right, um, sentences within the text and then made their annotations. So this person, for example, says, interesting. So does this mean a place is always a space, but a space is not always a place? I know this can sound like a bit of a tongue twister, right? Um, also, who gets to endow space with value so it becomes place? I provide students with a whole guide um, on different kinds of annotations, different ways of annotating a text. Um, but I just wanted to give you an example of this. And in the case of this student, even though I'm showing you the screen that I can use to grade through B courses, this student would also be able to view the annotations of around six other students in the class. So it's a great way of sort of bringing out the social aspect um, of the reading. It also gives students credit for doing the reading because it's so easy to grade. Um, this kind of comes back to something I was saying earlier about acknowledging the labor. Um, of a course and, and you know, validating that for students in terms of points. Um, and then this also, I think, has served as a fantastic way of uh, jumping off for class discussions, activities, et cetera, because I can always bring us back to what came through in your annotations, right? What, turn to each other and say one thing. Um, what do you most remember about this reading? And if it's helpful, bring up your annotation. Okay, so this I think has a lot of potential benefits. It's free, it's, it's easy, um, and completely through B courses. And I am like over by one minute or more. <laughs> so thank you all so much. <laughs>